The worst violence in Libya in a year. Dozens killed after the commander of an armed group is detained by rivals. The country remains divided, scarred by war and instability. Can Libya ever unite in peace again? What is its political future? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Libya's latest surge in violence seems to have settled down, but it once again underlines the country's instability. There's deep concern internationally about this week's unrest, in which dozens of people were killed and many more injured. The African Union and Western governments are calling for peace. Conflict and deep divisions have persisted since Muammar Gaddafi was overthrown 12 years ago. So what's next for Libya? Can the divided nation ever be reunited? And what will it take to restore peace? We'll discuss all this with our guests in just a few moments. But first, a report from Karaleg on the latest violence. An uneasy calm on the streets of Tripoli, days after the worst fighting in a year between rival factions in Libya's capital. Dozens of people were killed and more than 100 injured. A truce took hold after one side, the Special Deterrence Force, released this man, Mahmoud Hamza, a military commander from the 444 Brigade Armed Group. Analysts say he's an important figure in the battle for control of the country. The groups are two of many involved in the stop-start conflict that's plagued Libya. <laughs> since the NATO-backed revolt that toppled longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. The country is currently split between the UN-recognized government of national unity, headed by Prime Minister Abdul Hamid al dabeba in the west, and another in the east, backed by warlord Khalifa Haftar. The two rival administrations compete for power through shifting alliances within the armed groups on the ground. Debeba has issued an apology and warned against further violence. I apologize to the mothers, fathers, sisters and brothers who lost their children. Really apologize to them. All of us Libyans are not satisfied with what happened and we will not be satisfied with it. We will not be silent until we stop this matter. But three years after Libya's warring sides agreed on a permanent ceasefire in what the UN called an historic achievement, it seems there's still no sign of a lasting political solution. Kara Legg for Inside Story. Well, as you heard there, Libya has two rival administrations. Here's a look at who controls what. In the West, including the capital Tripoli, the internationally recognized government of national unity is in power. It's led by Prime Minister Abdul Hamid al dabeba and is backed by the UN. It controls the area in purple on the map. In the east, warlord Khalifa Haftar is in power, supported by a parliament in Tobruk. He controls the areas in orange. His self-styled army is backed by Russia, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt. And the rest of the country, shown in grey, is under the control of other armed groups. Well, the latest round of fighting in Tripoli was between two powerful groups, both backed by the UN-recognised government. The 444 Brigade is affiliated with the Defence Ministry and is reputed to be Libya's most disciplined. It controls the southern suburbs of Tripoli and other areas. The Special Deterrence Force is an ultra-conservative group that acts as the capital's police force. It controls central and eastern Tripoli and the airport. All right, let's get to our guests. Joining us are Anas El Gomati, who is the founder and the director of the uh, Sadek Institute, the first public policy think tank in Libya. From Toronto, we're joined by Imad Badi, a non-resident senior fellow at the Middle East programs at the Atlantic Council. And from San Antonio, Texas, we're joined by Mansour El Kikia, who's uh, professor of politics at the University of Texas, San Antonio, and regularly visits Libya for research work. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Anas, let's start with you. What's the beef between the 444 Brigade and the Special Deterrence Forces? Why would the latter uh, have arrested a colonel from the former? Who is Mahmoud Hamza? Well, the, the beef, as you put it, is down to a number of different things, and the context is going to be critical here. But it's a mixture of militia rivalries, you know, and strategic battles over key territory in Libya, and this backdrop, the political context in Libya, where there have been murmurs now for several months of back-channel talks between 
the government in Tripoli led by Abdul Hamid Dabeiba and Khalifa Haftar. So there is, I mean, there are always going to be turf battles and rivalries in, in Libya. And we, it was initially just dismissed as, as run of the mill, uh, you know, militia beef in Tripoli. But the, the territory that we're fighting over is in some of the most valuable real estate when it comes in terms of the strategic military and supply lines and logistical routes into Tripoli, the gates of Tripoli, that in 2019, Khalifa Haftar launched his offensive from. Uh, it's also the the, the, the the supply routes that were used by the rival administration that was set up in 2022, the government of national stability. And today, it's it's over oh, the last few days, it's been uh, the, the scene of those, of those rivalries. And I think it's curious that the timing of this backdrop, where there have been talks to uh, forge a new interim government between Abdul Hamid Dabeiba and Khalifa Haftar, that kind of political deal is, you know, just splitting up the cake. But which of the armed groups will remain in Tripoli? Who controls the valuable real estate? Possibly that that has been able to spiral this discussion. And the most valuable real estate is the old international airport that is looking to be launched or relaunched in the next several months, which is in the south of Tripoli and would move the center of gravity from Matiga Airport, where the SDF, the, the first group that arrested Colonel uh, Mahmoud Hamza in, in Tripoli, it would move the center of gravity and influence in the capital towards the south in an area that the 444 traditionally uh, call their, their stronghold. And it's an area that they have been trying to negotiate with the government of national unity over their control for the future. So it, it's a mixture of all those different rivalries. Mahmoud Hamza, it should be said, is also uh, a, an ardent uh, anti Haftar figure. He's been involved in some of these joint military talks that, that have been led by the UN over the last year, two years. And he has made his his uh, opinions quite clear about his position over Haftar. When the fighting was getting very intense over the last few days, we heard of rumors of different armed groups coming from Misrata, coming from different pockets around the country, many of whom are also anti Haftar figures. And it, it started to spiral out from one of those turf battles into a battle that looked like it was going to be a repeat of, of 2019. So I think it's it's curious timing. Hey, Matt, what, what do you make of it? Do you, do you agree with, with uh, Anas? The same groups clashed in May this year. That time there were injuries but no deaths. Uh, this time last year, 32 people were killed in Tripoli when groups allied to the, the two rival administrations fought. Um, does this week's violence uh, for, you know, bear any similarity to that? Or, or as Anas was saying, is this just part of a, a turf war? It, it's complicated. I think, yeah, you cannot dissociate things from the uh, political context and the overarching dynamics at a, at a national level. However, in terms of these clashes in in particular, I think there's no direct causal link between what is ha what, what is happening at a national level in terms of dialogues and positions uh, on Haftar and on his son Saddam's uh, on negotiations with the government of national unity's Prime Minister Abdel Hamid Baba and his relatives. I do think that there are much more local uh, Tripoli Tripolitanian dynamics at play, as in Western Libyan dynamics at play, in terms of the uh, impetus for these clashes in particular. Uh, the 444 Brigade uh, had has had tensions uh, with the SDF for quite a long time now, not just because of the airport uh, or the Tripoli International Airport opening, etc., but also because the very fact that Mahmoud Hamza was formerly a commander of the SDF and defected uh, from the SDF effectively after the Tripoli War established quite successfully, some may argue, uh, his own his own brigade that now controls uh, strategic territory has carved itself a role, not just in terms of security enforcement, but political dialogues, uh, etc. I wouldn't say that any of the players in Western Libya right now have a very clearly anti Haftar stance. I think a lot of them actually uh, are pretty much looking at uh, marginalizing opponents, vanquishing them, absorbing them in some cases. And this is both uh, both the case for the SDF, the Special Deterrence Force, and Mahmoud Hamza. Maybe the only fact, maybe the only fact that differentiates Mahmoud Hamza's group is the fact that its footprint does indeed extend beyond Tripoli. So as opposed to the modus operandi of most groups in Western Libya, it has several uh, branches in quite strategic cities like Beni Walid, like Tarhuna, and it has even had uh, its own patrols set up in Shwerif, etc. So you clearly see that it's encroaching on areas traditionally that aren't uh, the purview of Tripolitanian groups or Western groups from Western Libya. Um, so I think that is has partly played into the tensions 
with the SDF, and that's what that's what partly led to the clashes. Now, this isn't to discount the fact that these tensions and the now kind of clear-cut rivalry between these two groups will not be uh, politically uh, weaponized by other actors. They can leverage those tensions, but but in terms of a causal link, there wasn't anything there yesterday that lends itself to the suggestion that this was a sort of conspiracy uh, okay. or, or orchestrated by anyone in the background. All right. Man Mansour, given what, what Imad has just said, what does it say about the state of, of the country, though, that here you have two armed factions vying for influence and control uh, who've been largely at peace, they've kept the peace for the last year, and yet they can fight each other with heavy weaponry in a densely populated area of the, cap the capital city. I see. I, I, I want to commend this gentleman, the second one who said what he said, because I think he hit it right on, on, on the head, hit the nail right on the head. He's very, very right. It is not really so much tied to politics as much as tied to individuality and to turfs, to war. You have, you, have a, you have a war between thugs in Tripoli. This is, and this is, this is not new. It's been going on in, for God knows how long. Musrata hates Beni Walid. Beni Walid hates Zintan. Zintan hates Tripoli. It's, it's this, this, this turf areas within within the West. This is causing much of this. It's, it's a huge problem. It's not going to go away anytime soon. It's been going on for 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 six, seven hundred years. You know, and get that became he stopped it for a while, but now it reemerged again. With each side having their own militias. You, ha you have in Zintan, you have three militias. You have in Tarhuna, you have how many militias? Now, here's the funny thing. You know that the prime minister, Beba, can't go to Zintan? He can't go to Zawiya? He cannot go there. As a prime minister, he cannot move in those areas. The question is why, okay? <laughs> Security. Because he has no control in those areas. And this, is, this is the big problem. The fragmentation that's taking place after Gaddafi. Today, is really hampering any type of unity in the country. It's not going to happen. I mean, basically, I think Libyans have to come to the realization that perhaps they're not meant to be together anymore. Simple as that. I'm sorry to say this, but this is the reality on, on the ground. So, 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 Man, so you, you, think think that, have... you think that, that Libya is perhaps destined to, to, to split, to, to, to be two separate countries, that, that, that there's no hope for a united Libya? I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I think this is where it's heading. It's been, we've been going on now for 12 years, and this and this, and the more and the more it it goes on, the more this concept re is reinforced. I know one thing for sure. I know in, in Saranaka, at least, there's a huge movement building up and emerging right now. Whether it's in Tobruk, whether it's in Beva, whether it's especially in the Green Mountain, that is really beginning to call for separation. Go your own way. It's enough. We've had enough of this. We, we, I mean, this is what's happening. You have this turf war between thugs in the, in the, in the West. This is dominating the future of the country. It's not going to happen anymore. The, the ask, money for okay. the country, but these, these thugs as well, too. It's, it's difficult. Not, not, I'm not absolving the EC, though, because it is that we have a dictator as well, too. Hefter is certainly not a good guy anymore. You know, you think that he was, that he was at one time uh, a hope for Libya, and I thought that going to Tripoli, that he would, in fact, bring things together. But no, again, narcissism, the, 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 this, 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 um, this unbelievable. 80-year-old man, what is it you want more in the future except bring the, this country together, you know? But no, 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 he wants power. And power does corrupt and absolute power does corrupt absolutely. No doubt about that. And asked, do you want to, do you want to come in on, on that? The, the head of the African Union voiced great concern over the fighting and said that there is no military solution to the Libyan crisis and the country's unity, peace, stability and historic international status can only be regained by peaceful means. He's right, of course, but how can it ever happen? Well, I think, I mean, both of your guests have already pointed to the issue that the, these groups, whether they rest in the East, where they call themselves an army or pretend to be an army, or whether they're in the West and they've called themselves revolutionaries, but the revolution was a long time ago. Um, for the most part, there are criminal, there's criminal intent, but there's certainly autonomy to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, and for whom they want to do that for. But I wouldn't whitewash all of these pictures. Not all of the armed groups that are there, not all of the armed groups that have fought over the last 10 years have this criminal intent. Many are just fearful of going back to the years that were ruled under Gaddafi and don't want to return to military rule. I certainly believe, and, and I'm certainly conscious of the fact 
the Mahmoud Hamza in his engagement with the 5 plus 5 only in the last several months has made those points. I certainly don't think that he's the only one, and I think he's just a good example of someone that has made those points who's part of the infrastructure. But the reality being is that the current military status or the current militia breakup of Libya, state of, of play in Libya, is not compatible with a unified state, certainly not compatible with a democratic state, because they're not neutral, subservient uh, bodies that will serve an elected government. They're being calibrated to be controlled by either Khalifa Haftar in, in the east or Abdul Hamid Dabeba in the west, or whichever political entrepreneur throws his hat into the card. They need to start from the building block. And I think the solution that you're asking for really is to destroy and disrupt or at the very least try to reform these bodies. But the reality is, is that you're not going to get anywhere unless you try to disrupt these bonds that have tied them together. City-state militias in the cities that Mansour was mentioning, the areas that, uh, that Ahmed has been talking about, that each area or each uh, part outside of Tripoli itself or the greater Tripolitania region is controlled by a little militia. That is not, that is not consistent with with the kind of army and neutral uh, services or security services that would be compatible with an elected government. And if we think of it that way, they're only compatible with governments that are appointed by these political entrepreneurs. If you want to start from, from a really uh, an idealistic point, and it is idealistic because the UN isn't trying to work towards those ends of trying to you know scratch the surface clean and start with a fresh neutral military force and a neutral uh, uh, police service. It's working with what it's already got. It's working with gr groups that have certain sympathies, certain allegiances, and it's trying to calibrate them towards these leaderships. And that's not going to work in the long run for Libya. So I would certainly say that, but I, I, I think putting your finger on the pulse, the responsibility now is on the UN to build the architecture for that, to not politicize its military tracks that are looking to unify two different groups that are not consistent with each other. The second is that you can't calibrate them around an appointed government that would be Libya's seventh over the last decade. It doesn't need that. It needs an elected government. Two and a half million Libyans are waiting for that. And in terms of, of separation, I would cast that on that. There are certainly groups there, but whether they're minority groups, and I certainly think they're minority groups that have done this, I don't think it's linked to just the militia violence in Tripoli. I mean, we shouldn't, we should, we shouldn't forget that the parliament in the East was burnt down in summer protests, and it's the parliament that decides when or when we don't have elections. They set the election law. They set the constitutional basis, the two milestones that we can have elections. Everyone else is just a benefactor. But these are, these are the main structural causes that are impeding this progress forward. And it's the irony today that if we think that we're going to get, as Libyans, in a personal capacity here, if you think that we're going to get statehood for Eastern Libya or Western Libya, get in line at the UN Security Council. You have many, many groups before you, mainly even the Andalusians and the Ba'ath separatists might be ahead of the Libyans who don't have a national cause. When it comes down to what they ask for, the groups that are screaming the loudest ask for oil, okay. ask for strategic autonomy, yeah. ask for their guys to be recognised. It's not a national movement. Imad, is all of this an indication that the international community has utterly failed uh, as far as Libya is concerned? Uh, is it the outside world interested enough in Libya? What more could, should it be doing? The Libyan case is definitely one of serial failures of the, of the international community and a, and a definitive case of UN, I would say, failure and multilateralism's failure uh, over time since, since, 20, since 2011, essentially. It's, a, it's been a downward trend and a spiral, spiraling trend for people there into violence. Uh, I would single out the the current, actually, special representative to the Secretary General as being, I would, what I would call diplomatically uh, very complacent uh, in terms of how his mediation has gone, if, if any, uh, over the political process. The political process now is in shambles. There is absolutely no direction to it. The UN is uh, main main talking point is this rhetorical support. Uh, of elections okay. with little to no uh, actual uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, I, I just want to. I, I just want to point point out that he's. I mean, he's not here to defend himself here. So I mean, I, but I want to make that, that that point clear. But yes, carry on. Absolutely, but I do think he's been in listening mode far too long. So you clearly see him doing field visits and actually doing some of the work that would pave the way for something. But every time you wait on actually something to be formalized and a dialogue to be institutionalized. There hasn't been much there. So, and that leaves the the country uh, to be preyed upon by the for the very forces that we are talking about here, i.e., the military actors, the political entrepreneurs, 
that don't have the country's best interests at heart. So it's no surprise that none of them are really supportive of actual uh, election and a, a suffrage because for the past 10 to 12 years, they've dominated the, the scene and they know that people are fed up with them in most cases, at least with the parliament and the high state council and some of the controversial figures and that they would never be voted in. So it, it's it's a very uh, uh, honestly frustrating cycle for a lot for a lot of people. And now the bar is so low that they're very happy with a uh, small, like very basic things, but very, very basic stability and very artificial stability uh, that, that the current government is, 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 is providing for the government of national unity. However, that stability, uh, as pointed out by these clashes, can sometimes be an illusion because what, what this government is, is doing is it's essentially attempting to recreate Gaddafi's system, revenue distribution, uh, a lot of handouts, a lot of, uh, social safety nets, a lot of patronage structures, a lot of corruption, but uh, it's trying to recreate that with a very different security system with no monopoly on violence. So you have these tensions that will ultimately erupt between the groups, particularly in Western Libya, but this is as valid for Western Libya as it is for Eastern Libya, because I do think that in Eastern Libya, tensions between uh, tribes and social structures in the East are uh, very much there with the governing structures from a security standpoint, i.e. Uh, Khalifa Haftar and his sons. Therefore, yeah, th this illusion of stability has to at some point unravel, and the unraveling will unfortunately be violent if there is no meaningful political direction uh, for or an outlet for people to actually discuss, cast their vote ideally, and elect who they want. And this isn't to say that elections will be a panacea either. They need to be properly regulated. There needs to be a, an accompanying, particularly security plan in order for them not to be rigged. We don't okay. also want to end up in a Lebanon-like scenario where yeah. we have armed group leaders and the relatives of armed groups elected. Okay. I, 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 we'll come on to elections in just a moment. But first, Mansour, I just want to turn the, the question I put to um, Imad there on, on its head when I said, is the outside world interested enough in, in, in Libya? Um, are there actually too many people meddling in Libyan affairs at the moment? We mentioned uh, France, the UAE, Russia, uh, Turkey. I mean, are there just, are there just too many people uh, messing in Libyan affairs? Yes, it reminds me of Lebanon, poor Lebanon. Where the Arabs had their well, Arabs among Arabs had their, their battles in in Lebanon. I mean the the, the Egyptians against the Syrians, the Saudis against the Egyptians, the, uh, the Turks. Against, it's unbelievable. The same thing with Libya. What what does Qatar had to do in Libya? Or Emirates in Libya? Or Saudi Arabia in Libya? What had they got to do there? I'm telling you. I mean you ask a, a, a really a very profound question. And this is, <laughs> has the UN been a, been a bad player in this thing? And yes, I think it has been an awful player. To me, the United, the United Nations and the, and the international community as a whole really acts like, a, and I, I call them, what, what, my, what my term for them is that, if you marry my mother, I call you dad. In this case, you know, as long as I have a government that I can talk with, it doesn't matter what kind of government it is. It can be the worst government in the world, but at least I can talk to it. This is this is awful. This is, this is an awful way of looking at things. I mean, I was just in a conference this some time ago, and Stephanie Williams, she said, and I had a high admiration for her. She was saying, "Well, we have to have elections. Elections for what? I mean, we've been having elections, and what have we been having? We've been having thugs coming and come in power." I mean, the baby has no qualifications to be a prime minister. Hefter has no qualifications to be what he is. He was in America for 23 years, and he can't even speak English, for goodness sake. I mean, you have individuals who are there because it's a booty, no more and no less. There's no sense that this belongs to me. This is Libya. I care about it. And if Libyans don't care about it, why the heck should the international community do that either? Simple as that. And as the UN had hoped... Uh, that much delayed elections could have been held this year due to the relative stability in the country. Uh, is there any chance of that happening anytime soon, do you think? The rules of the game are rigged in this election because the system itself has been rigged to allow for these rival parliaments that continue to claim that they're rivals but have conspired despite conflict, despite competition, and despite what many of, uh, of, of Libya's conflicts have looked like, 
all of these different enemies then come together and they're enemies of benefits. They're not just friends with benefits, they're enemies, or they purport to be enemies of benefits. And they, they share the spoils and they continue to allow Libya to, to roll around this merry-go-round with the illusion that because they can't agree to elections, that they can't happen. But then they always agree to have a unity government. It's quite curious that they can unify their interests when it comes to sharing the spoils of war, but they can't unify their interests when they have to let go of power. That is the that is the, the the irony of the case today. And I think when it comes to who Libyans may elect, it's quite interesting. There was a poll done by Duane Research at the end of 2021, towards the towards the deadline for the 24th of December elections. And it's so interesting. The I don't know vote got 14%. It got more than most of the candidates that had stood. The Agela Salah, the head of the parliament, got one and a half percent, or less than one percent rather. Fethi Bashara, the strong man of the West got one and a half percent. Khalifa Haftar, despite controlling eastern Libya and, and ramming it down everyone's throats, couldn't get more than seven percent. It's the irony that all of these individuals know that if it, even if they were to stand for elections with okay. enough time, they wouldn't get past those votes. So I think Libyans are desperate for a choice to move forward, but the system is rigged against okay. them. And the UN continues to allow that system to be rigged against them. It's a shame. All right. Um, um... Imad, a very quick answer for you uh, from you. Uh, we've got about a minute left. I mean, uh, no, no elections anytime soon. I, I, I agree, essentially. There okay. wouldn't be any elections anytime soon. And Part of that is because of what Anas mentioned in terms of the system being rigged. What is worrying, however, is the increase in, I would say, uh, the bubble that both the armed groups and the politicians now now live in. A lot of the okay. links that existed between the armed the armed groups were at some point closer to the civilians. Today, okay. with these types of clashes that you see, with the use of heavy weaponry, etc., you clearly see that that those links are have been severed, okay. even and in the areas where they that were revolutionary strongholds. Sorry. All right, that's okay, Mansour. Fi final question to you: Do Libyans have any cause for hope right now that that, that things will get better? Oh, hope is always there, but it continues to be a hope, nothing else. I mean, given, given the situation on the ground, I, d I don't see much future anymore in Libya as it is. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but this is the reality. It's, it's, I hope not. I hope I'm wrong. Not, nothing, nothing will please me than to see the country come together. But now what the country is paying for is for the 40 years that the previous dictator had, 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 had already spent. And now we're paying this due. Okay. And this, this is what we have. Gentlemen, there we must end it. Many thanks indeed to you all, Anas El Gamati, Imad Badi, and uh, Mansour El Kikia. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website at altazira.com. For further discussion, join us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again.